I also would like to uh, remind people that today's meeting is going to be recorded as well. We still have some folks joining actively. Um, so we're just gonna give it another minute before we start. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Nice to see so many familiar faces. I see Shay, hi, I see Pat, hi Paul. Hi, both Pauls. <laughs> oh, for uh, a nice check in, um, just uh, so everybody can get acquainted with each other uh, in the chat, um, you're more than welcome um, to put your name, agency, uh, and something that you are grateful for today. All right, Carrie, I think we're good to go ahead and get started. All right. Um, I, will, I will remind folks um, before you take it away with your welcome, Carrie, I will remind folks to please mute yourselves if you haven't already. Um, this is a meeting style meeting, not a PowerPoint presentation style meeting. Um, so if you so you are able to unmute yourself, but please don't do so unless uh, you're speaking. Thank you. Go ahead, Carrie. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Carrie Casey. I work for Newcastle County and I've been your chair for since 2015 and um, and welcoming you to our annual meeting today. Another year. Um, it's wonderful to read some of these uh, messages. That was a great one, um, Aaron, in terms of um, what people are grateful for today. That's awesome. So I'm grateful for coffee. That's a good one. I'm just looking at some of them. Those are really good. I'm grateful I was able to get my computer rebooted and into Zoom just a few minutes late. I love that. Uh, a lot of coffee. I'm grateful for the sunshine. I'm grateful for the full moon from Paul. That's fun. That's a good one, Paul. Um, sorry, I'm just, I'm enjoying these, these things. Um, these grateful, what we're grateful for this morning, because there is a lot to be grateful for. And I'd have to say, I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for all of you. And for the last, I'm going to get emotional here, <laughs> for the last six years that I've been the chair of COC. Um, even though it's been at times tough, I feel like I think of the quote that, you know, together, this is my, from Helen Keller, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And I feel as a COC, we, you know, we, we came, we actually started as like the official COC in 2015. And what has happened, not only like within the last year, but since 2015, we've grown our membership, we've grown and educated folks on people um, about the issues of homelessness in our state. We've brought in additional funding to our state. And I think most you know, impactfully to me um, is we've become advocates for people that that haven't had a voice. And I feel like a lot in, in our government and in our world. And I really thank you all for that. So um, I know that we have a lot to get through today, but you know, not to, I just wanna thank everyone. I, I particularly wanna thank the staff of the of Housing Alliance Delaware that have been so wonderfully supportive um, through the years as well as the COC board that I've, you know, become very dear friends with many of you all. Um, I'd like to say, you know, vice, my vice chair, John Bates, um, you know, we, he's always like there with me um, supporting as we, as we do this work. I want to thank him and all the members. Again, I feel like I've learned so much, um, you know, in my little bubble of Newcastle County, I've learned a lot about some of the issues in Sussex County and Kent County and Dover 
And, um, you know, I've really grown and I feel like it's really been one of the most, you know, I'd say one of the top, top, top experiences of my career to be the chair yes, and to colleagues. really represent the COC. Um, so I just want to say thanks and that then, and also welcome you to our annual meeting. So then I'm going to turn it over to the wonderful HAD staff. So thanks guys. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I think many of you know, but uh, maybe not all of you do, and uh, Carrie might have mentioned this, but this is her last uh, COC quarterly meeting as chair. Um, so her, her words of thanks, um, she mean a lot, um, hopefully to you. Um, they definitely mean a lot to me. Um, and so we're gonna be talking about a new board slate and new board chair today. Um, but before we do that, I actually believe um, we have Paul, uh, Representative Paul Bomback here today, um, and I think he has something he would like to share. Um, Paul, are you there? I am. Thank you. I'm giving you, you the much. floor. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm going to put on in, in front of my screen, I have, this is what a house tribute looks like. Um, and I'm going to put on my glasses because there's too many words to say about Carrie to use a large enough font for my old eyes. So the State of Delaware House of Representatives tribute, be it hereby known to all, that the House of Representatives acknowledges Carrie Casey. Upon her retirement, we recognize Ms. Casey for her amazing dedication of serving as the chair of the Delaware Continuum of Care, COC, since its inception in 2015. Ms. Casey has worked with community partners and leaders to encourage the growth of the COC that currently has more than 100 members and six active committees. Due to her remarkable leadership, participation, and federal funding for homeless assistance programs have greatly increased in the Delaware COC. To continue her vision, Ms. Casey has assisted in the creation of a proactive board that is devoted to preventing and ending the homelessness in Delaware. We commend Ms. Casey's outstanding contributions as they have truly made a difference in the lives of so many. We bestow our very best wishes for continued success. House of Representatives extends its sincere appreciation, directs this tribute to be issued on the 20th day of October, 2021, signed by the Speaker of the House, Pete Schwartzkopf, Clerk of the House, Rich Puffer, my colleague, Representative Krista Griffith, and myself, Representative Paul Baumbach. Um, please, Carrie, let us uh, just know how much we appreciate all that you've done, and we know that you're continuing to do. Thank you very, very much. That is very wonderful, humbling, and I really appreciate this. And uh, means a lot, so thank you. Um, if we were in person right now, um, which I do look forward to again, um, you would probably be hearing thunderous applause. So I'd like to ask everyone to unmute themselves um, and let's take a moment and give Carrie an applause. Thank you, Paul. Hey, Carrie. Hey, hey. yes. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. And then don't forget to mute yourself again. <laughs> Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and I'm going to now hand it over to Erin. Erin, take it away. Yes. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, and again, we would just like to say thank you so much to Carrie for her incredible leadership over the last couple of years. Um, we, you're not leaving the board, so it's not like you're going anywhere, but we are very grateful for everything that you've done for the state. So with that, we are just going to go over the agenda. Um, so we have quite a bit to get through today. Um, so we are going to be moving a little bit quickly. Uh, the first thing we're gonna go into is um, the COC membership drive. Um, and I am going to go ahead and hand that over to Felicia. Good morning, everyone. So um, my name is Felicia. I'm COC program specialist. I work alongside Erin. Um, when uh, communicating, um, you probably all know my email. Um, so uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the membership drive um, fiscal year 2022. So HUD requires COCs to provide an annual open invitation to the community for membership. Um, our membership drive ran from September 1st to September 30th. Um, you all probably have gotten the multiple notices about our um, electronic membership form. Um, it is a requirement for all uh, new and existing members. Um, and at this time, Erin, could you add the link um, to the membership form in the chat? Um, if you have not already, please go ahead and fill out that form. Um, it takes 
just less than two minutes, um, ask very basic information, your name, organization you're with, um, and a couple other categories that you may fall into. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to sign up for our one of our subcommittees. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so we had 121 members complete the membership form. Um, of that membership, of that completion, 36 voting members, including board, board members, and 100 members signed up for one or more committee. So if you see there, um, we have the multiple committees that we have. Um, looks like 53 signed up for advocacy and policy, um, 11 for membership and nominations, 26 for racial justice and equity, 44 for service solutions, and 22 for system performance. Um, I want to... Um, thank and also encourage everyone to sign up for um, one of our subcommittees because that is how we get the work done. Um, that is one of um, our main streams of bringing in the community, making decisions together and making sure that we have everyone at the table to make those decisions. Um, so if you have not already, please consider signing up for a committee. Um, we have a few committees that are also needing a chair. Um, and so uh, we just would really like your participation. Um, and then 55 members um, that filled out the membership form identified as participants in centralized intake. Um, so uh, that's just, that's great. Uh, Aaron, if you can move on. All right, so on this side, we have um, the HUD required uh, membership representation. So HUD requires us to have uh, membership, uh, membership in each of these categories here. Um, you can kind of see uh, where the COC falls, um, where the Delaware COC falls into what categories. Um, we are looking for EMS and crisis response teams. Um, that is somewhere that um, we could use um, some more resources there. Um, other categories that um, we would like to include, include reentry, higher education, workforce development, um, things like that. But um, as a COC, it is um, our responsibility to kind of make sure that these categories are being filled. So as members within your scope of network and your influence, we always encourage you guys to always reach out um, to people who may fit some of these categories or even just be a, just be a good fit for the Delaware COC. Mary, if you could move on. And lastly, we just have um, just a layout of the organizational representation that we do have now. Um, as you can see, we have about 70 organizations um, that um, the COC um, that everyone is a part of. And so um, that's just a visual for you all there. Of course, we're always looking to grow um, the COC. We're always looking to expand and reach out. Um, to different um, agencies and um, to kind of just make sure that the work is done, make sure everyone's at the table um, having these important conversations and um, doing this work. Um, I believe that was it for me. Um, and we do have a question in the chat. Um, Stacy asks um, if she could have more information about EMS and crisis response and what that consists of. Um, so Stacy, to answer your question and for everybody else, um, EMS would be uh, anybody who is um, employed by like fire departments, um, the paramedics, um, emergency responders, um, the Delaware crisis hotline, um, the mobile unit that goes out, uh, anything that um, is really targeted at people who are in their most vulnerable states uh, and experiencing crisis at that time. Um, so if you know anybody who is interested or uh, anybody who uh, has an interest in serving, um, or working to end homelessness in the state that fits that criteria, um, go ahead and send them our way and we will get them uh, involved and ready. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, um, and next thing we wanted to go over um, for this year's okay. membership, um, these are the amount of people um, who signed up to be voting members this year. Um, so voting members are um, part of the COC. They are comprised of um, the COC board members as well as additional members from the COC. Uh, and they are going to be responsible for voting on the COC charter. Uh, and we will be going into that in a couple of minutes. Uh, the voting members also vote on the COC uh, board slate and the uh, chairs. So we are looking at our fiscal year 22 board slate. Uh, so we are very, very excited about the uh, turnout for the board this year. The COC board can have up to 21 members uh, and we are looking at going into fiscal year 22 with a full 21 member board, which is really, really exciting. Um, you guys can kind of see the breakdown um, of all the different members on our board and the different uh, sectors uh, that they um, cover. So coming on to the board this year, nominations, we have uh, Sue Ryan uh, with the Delaware Coalition Against Domestic Violence. We also have Alexia Wolf, uh, who is with the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Uh, and we have Dana Mitchell, who is with Newcastle County. Um, Coming off the board this year are Marcy Rizak, uh, who is formerly with the Delaware Coalition Against Domestic Violence, um, Deborah Gilbert White, who is uh, with Her Story Ensemble, uh, and Carrie, who's remaining on the board, but is renouncing chair. Uh, so we would just like to take the time to thank both Marcy um, and Deborah for all of their hard work um, on the COC board for the last couple of years. Um, they provided such wonderful perspectives on a variety of issues um, and were some of our strongest advocates um, for persons experiencing homelessness throughout the state. So on behalf of the entire COC, I would just like to thank them for their service. Uh, and we definitely, uh, I think we've all gone into how great Gary is um, and how thankful we are to her. Uh, so for the fiscal year 22 board slate, um, for the voting members, we will be sending out an e-vote following the meeting today so that um, you guys are able to vote on the full slate, the new nominations, uh, and the chair nominations that we are going to go into next. So the first nomination for chair we have uh, is Susan Kent. Uh, Susan Kent uh, was formerly with Love Inc. of uh, Sussex, or uh, what? Mid Delmarva, there we go. I always forget. Um, she has been on the COC board for several years um, and she has recently moved into a role uh, in affordable um, housing development. Um, Susan provides a fantastic perspective uh, and feedback from Sussex County. Uh, so at this time, I would just like to um, open the floor up to Susan to say a couple words. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, it's um an honor to be nominated uh, for this position. I think of Carrie Casey as um, who I wanna be when I grow up. Um, she's been a, such a superstar, um, especially during um, being the lead of this awesome um, coalition um, during COVID. Um, Carrie had to um, do double time uh, doing work on what, what the role of the continuum of care is, is mobilizing the nonprofit community, government, and faith sectors together um, to offer continuum of care um, to people experiencing homelessness. And um, I just have a huge passion um, to continue um, all the knowledge that I learned for the last 11 years as director of Love Inc., um, a very busy nonprofit. Um, and one of the big things that we um, were able to do with a huge leadership team, bringing people together, community together, volunteer based was, um, you know, secure shelter um, for so many people in Sussex County. Um, so not doing that work anymore, but still having a passion um, for the homeless and, and um, taking that next step into actually housing um, people. Um, I want to be able to use um, the knowledge that I learned, the blood on the street, the, um, the crisis that we're in right now, um, and be able to be um, a voice um, for Delaware. Um, I know I'm a huge advocate for, for Sussex County, um, but homelessness knows no borders. And 
and uh, all, all of all of uh, us working together is so critical. So I was very um, caught off guard by the nomination, but I thought about it, and um, I think um, that I have the right. Um, I have the history and the experience. I've been with the COC since 2015 when we became a charter. Um, I've been on the ranking committee. Um, I've worked with um, the governance that you're getting ready to um, hopefully vote in. Um, and so I have some experience um, that I think is um, gonna suit well. Uh, so thank you very much for the nomination. And, uh, and I look forward to continuing to work on the board no matter what the outcome is today. Awesome. Thank you, Susan. All right. Our next nomination for chair uh, is Dana Mitchell. Uh, so Dana currently serves um, for Newcastle County as a housing locator coordinator um, with the Hope Center, helping families um, identify housing in the community. Um, she also uh, is the owner of um, the ELS properties, um, which provides housing um, services in the state. Um, and Dana has been in the sector for almost 20 years. Uh, so I would like to um, let Dana open it up now. Good morning, good morning, everyone. And greetings to uh, board chair. Um, congratulations again to your wonderful services, Carrie members and all those that serve the COC and guest. Uh, I am Dana Mitchell, and I would be honored to have your vote to become the next board chairman. Uh, as stated with almost 20 years experience working in the housing industry with a concentration in homeowner association management, residential management, such as affordable housing, tax credit, and the housing choice voucher program. And now most recently as the housing locator coordinator, with Newcastle County's Hope Center. Um, and also stated, I am the proud owner of ELS Properties, which offers quality and affordable housing. Being in this field, I have direct knowledge of housing, of the housing market, landlord and tenant relations, and understand the challenges that the rental market is currently facing today. In addition, I'm an active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Diamond State Pearls, where I serve as president, and a member of the Order of Eastern Stars. These well-known and worldwide organizations focal point are being a service to all mankind. Again, which I pride myself of being a part of. My education background, I'm a graduate of the Delaware State University, where I received my bachelor's in the concentration of public relations and a minor in marketing, and Wilmington University, where I received my master's in the concentration of public administration. I also hold numerous housing certifications. As I hope you will come to see as your next board chair, my love, passion, and dedication in helping others, especially the homeless, have been the forefront of my career and personal life. I'm a strong believer it takes a village, and we, are that village. Though a novice to the COC program, I believe my experience will be the perfect transition to this team, though big shoes to fill following uh, Carrie Casey, but I've worked with many of you uh, throughout my tenure in the housing market. I will be honored to have the opportunity to work with you to continue the mission to end Delaware's homelessness. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dana, and thank you so much, Susan. Uh, like we said, we will be um, sending out an e-vote to all of the voting members following the meeting um, so that we can uh, get a vote for the board chair. Um, we will be asking that all votes are submitted by the end of the week, um, and all of that information will be provided um, during the e-vote as well. Uh, so the next thing that we want to talk about is the COC membership survey. Um, along with the COC um, membership drive this year, we did include a um, like feedback and satisfaction survey. Um, so these are just some of the key results that came out of that feedback. Um, so we only had about 25 people complete the survey. Um, we do intend on uh, doing this uh, annually. So this will uh, have the opportunity to come up again. Uh, we are always 
always looking for your guys' feedback um, and opportunities to improve. Um, so it's we would love um, if you guys could provide any additional information um, outside of uh, those who participated. So anybody who didn't get a chance, please feel free to reach out to me or Felicia with any of your suggestions. Uh, so the first uh, result was how satisfied are you with the Delaware continuum of care? Um, so that was out of one being zero satisfied and five being the most satisfied. Um, so here uh, it looks like we are doing a pretty okay job in the eyes of those who completed the survey. Uh, one of the other main areas that we asked about uh, was training. Um, so one of the questions was what additional training opportunities would you like to see offered by the COC? Uh, so we can see uh, several ideas there, which a bunch of them are definitely coming down the pipeline uh, this year. Uh, we are definitely um, trying to stick to our momentum of ramping up the COC's training and technical assistance. Um, so we really are looking to uh, provide that uh, level of engagement uh, with the COC and uh, everybody who is involved with uh, homeless services throughout the state. Uh, some of the um, Trainings here that were suggested are um, italicized. Um, so that would be NOVA priorities, rapid rehousing program development, and basics of housing first. Um, so those we did offer um, trainings on this year. Um, and I included the links, uh, which the slides will be available on the website and they will be sent out afterwards. Uh, but the links to the pages where those uh, that information and those trainings are available uh, are here on this slide for, for everyone. Um, so again, any additional um, ideas or feedback um, for training for COC members that you would like to see, um, please let us know. Uh, and we had several uh, open response questions uh, for um, the survey. So some of those were like how satisfied you are, in what ways your experience could be improved, uh, and do you have any suggestions or concerns? Uh, so here are some of the uh, overarching strengths and the overarching areas of improvement uh, that we received for that. Uh, so I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on here, um, but so we do have quite a bit of um, areas of improvement, uh, but we do have some pretty awesome strengths as well. So I just want to thank everybody who took the time to provide feedback to us. Again, it's super important that you guys um, help inform the process uh, so that we are meeting your needs because uh, the COC is for you um, and for the uh, clients that you guys serve. Uh, so one of the other feedbacks, uh, feedback that we received was that uh, lots of people didn't know where to go to find the information. Uh, so here are just some additional resources for not only the Delaware continuum of care, uh, but the continuum of care in general. Uh, so the Delaware COC website um, has information on membership, governance, reporting, events and funding. Um, there's also an archives page so that you can uh, see um, all of the past things that we've done and we've had on the website. Uh, the HUD exchange is HUD's main website. So linked here is the COC page for that. Uh, and you are always, always more than welcome to reach out to myself or Felicia if you have any questions at all. Uh, we are always willing to make ourselves available uh, to you guys for um, any questions, any information, uh, any assistance that you need. Uh, and if we can't help, we will do our best to find somebody uh, who is able. Um, so I would always I would refer to it as an open door policy, uh, but since we are all virtual, I will say it's an open uh, email and open Zoom policy. So if anybody ever needs anything, please just let me know. So that's it for the membership survey. Uh, we are going to uh, scoot into governance. Uh, so one of the main uh, responsibilities of the continuum of care uh, is to develop a charter for operating uh, and a system of governance. Uh, so we are required on a yearly basis to revisit that charter uh, and make any updates or improvements. Uh, and this year we actually contracted out with um, Diana T. Myers and Associates uh, to help us overhaul our entire governance process. Uh, our charter had not been significantly updated uh, since its inception 
exception and there was lots of room for improvement. Uh, so we are really, really excited um, of the work that came out of that this year. In terms of process, the board uh, formed a governance subcommittee. Uh, so that included uh, both of our chair and vice chair um, and some additional very key members of our COC board, um, the HAD staff and DMA staff. Uh, the committee's purpose was to do an in-depth review of the charter uh, and the MOUs and draft comprehensive changes uh, to both uh, to be approved this year. Uh, and the committee met weekly from April to June 2021. So it was a significant amount of work that was put into this. Um, and I would just like to thank uh, everybody who participated in that process. Um, your participation was invaluable and we're really excited about all of the changes that were made. So just a little quick overview of the charter changes. So the charter itself was restructured in the way that it um, looks. So there are six sections or eight sections to the charter. Uh, anything that is italicized and orange uh, was updated through this process. Um, so you guys can kind of see um, the amount of significant work that was put in um, throughout the entire charter. So uh, the updates could look like um, clarifying language or uh, adding sections, defining roles, um, really beefing up the uh, clarity around operations um, and adding information that we need for um, to operate properly as a COC. So kind of a summary and update of changes. Uh, so through the whole charter, uh, we generalize the language so that the charter can withstand minor to moderate changes in COC operations and policy. Um, so that looks like um, saying like, COC lead agency versus like Housing Alliance Delaware, um, so that if we are ever not the ones that fulfill that role, the charter does not have to be changed in that aspect. Um, we took a lot of external policies and piecemeal documents uh, and either incorporated them into the charter or they are referenced and hyperlinked throughout uh, so that people can easily access those. Uh, we drafted it so the structure and the operations of the COC can be easily understood by anyone who's unfamiliar with the COC. Uh, that was a lot of the feedback uh, that we received via the um, survey as well, uh, is that people don't really understand what we do. Uh, so we tried to take that into account with uh, the restructure of the charter. Um, Again, it's up, um, applicable regardless of any specific parties that are implementing. Uh, we add a clarity around relationships, committee structure and accountability, uh, membership and policies and process. Uh, we incorporate a consistency throughout the structure and the language utilized. Uh, we consolidated any duplicative content and we added additional standards around information sharing and transparency. One of the other things um, that we added, uh, which I just wanted to highlight here, was a visual for the COC structure. Uh, so this kind of shows how everybody connects to each other uh, and how decisions are made, uh, who is accountable to who and who acts on behalf of who. Uh, so this is available in one of the appendices of the charter. Uh, and as soon as the charter is voted on and approved, uh, we will be adding it to the website and sending it out to everybody so that um, you all have access to this information. Does anybody have any questions on the governance process um, or anything like that before we move on to funding? Um, you can feel free to unmute yourself um, or put your questions in the chat. Uh, I would also offer um, anybody who participated in the governance uh, process, uh, if you have any additional um, words to go ahead and um, let us know. Okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, again, if any of you guys have any questions, go ahead and put it in the chat uh, or follow up with me afterwards. Uh, we will be sending out um, an e-vote to the voting members to adopt the new charter as well following the meeting. Uh, and then we get into funding. 
Um, so a COC funding update, uh, we kind of covered this at the last uh, meeting, but this year um, the there is a competitive process for continuum of care funding. Uh, last year due to COVID, HUD did a auto renewal process for all of our COC funded um, projects. Uh, so there was not a competitive process last year. Uh, this year they have reinstated the competitive process. Uh, so we are in the throes of getting that ready uh, this year. Um, the submission deadline for the uh, NOFO um, is November 16th, 2021, so we are very fast approaching. Uh, Housing Alliance Delaware is the collaborative applicant uh, for the Delaware COC, uh, which means that our role is to coordinate the process by which the annual consolidated application uh, is submitted to HUD on behalf of the COC. Um, so what that looks like is uh, administering the local competition, um, getting all of the evaluation materials ready, scoring and ranking projects, um, getting everything approved by the board, getting everybody into the system with their applications and completing the entire application on behalf of the COC, tying that up in a neat little bow and sending it off to HUD. Um, so we are in that process now um, and we are very excited for um, what is going to come out of that this year. The uh, Delaware COC receives a little over $8 million uh, in COC funding. Uh, and this year, 100% uh, of our uh, renewal funding is safe. Uh, meaning that um, we will not be like losing any funding this year and we have the opportunity to gain funding through other um, for through new bonus and things like that. So not only is the process competitive this year, but there is also new funding available. Um, so it's very, very exciting. Um, this year. Um, just some priorities that were put forth in the NOFO, um, so things that uh, HUD is really looking to see within our responses and see uh, within our um, COC um, is number one, ending homelessness. Uh, that is the purpose of the COC, uh, and it is super important. Uh, we have housing first, uh, reducing homelessness, improving system performance, um, and partnering with health, housing, and service agencies. Um, so this is just a brief overview. The NOFO document and more detail is available on our funding page, um, which is linked um, in the PowerPoint, uh, but we will be sending um, again that out later. Uh, so if anybody has any questions about the NOFO process or COC funding in general, uh, please let me know. I'd be happy to have those uh, more detailed conversations with you guys. We also have some really exciting additional funding opportunities um, coming to the community through um, a lot of the relief money that is funneling through the state. Um, so the first opportunity is the Community Investment Recovery Fund. Um, Governor Carney and Lieutenant Governor Hall Long um, announced that they are doing major investments uh, in nonprofits for capital projects. Um, so that is... Um, so capital projects for communities that were hit by COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so that's investing capital assets uh, in enabling work, education, and health monitoring. Um, uh, capital pro uh, projects uh, that are designed to address uh, critical needs that resulted from or were made apparent by the COVID-19 public health emergency um, and capital projects that are designed to address um, critical needs of the community. Um, so the application for that is due on November 30th, 2021. Uh, and the website is listed here. So um, you can receive more information. Uh, but we highly encourage um, anybody who is interested to apply for that funding. Additionally, the Christiana Care um, Health um, System also put out a community investment fund. Uh, I love that name. Um, I love the investments in the community that are coming out of the pandemic. Um, it's kind of like the bright side of a very uh, negative situation. 
Um, but for 2022, Christiana Care is providing up to $100,000 per organization to create or enhance programs that address the following. Um, so that is housing access, so short or long-term housing projects, um, support for individuals who are homeless or in temporary housing situations, um, support for repairs which impact health and safety, and education to support housing initiatives. Uh, that application is due on November 12th uh, and is linked as well. Um, so some ideas for what that funding could be used for um, look like uh, home improvements for uh, extremely low income families. Um, so that might look like mold remediation um, or anything like that. Um, for emergency shelter providers, that might look like improving access to uh, facilities, um, creating um, accessible facility, uh, facilities that could be used uh, through the capital funds. Uh, and also uh, another highly highly identified need in the community is uh, housing locators. Um, I'm looking at you, Dana. So uh, funding can also be used for housing location services. Um, that is has been a huge identified need throughout the community in the last year. Um, so these funds can also be used um, for those as well. All right. And to wrap up our COC business, um, we have a very exciting uh, COC logo vote. Um, so this year uh, we worked on developing new uh, COC logos. Um, so we have the options listed here. The first one is just the standard um, normal COC logo. And then we have two new options. Uh, so we are actually going to do a live poll uh, and ask you guys to vote on um, if you would like to stick with our existing logo or if you would like to um, switch things up and update to one of the newer versions. Uh, so I am going to go ahead uh, and let Felicia um, administer that poll. Um, so we'll give you guys a minute or two to do that. Uh, and then we'll look at the results. All right. So in just a minute, I'm going to launch the poll. You have the option between one, two, or three based on the pictures on the screen. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think we have a clear winner. <laughs> okay, give it a little bit more time. Get a, let a few more people cast their votes. Give it 30 more seconds. All right, we're going to end it here. And it looks like option two was the most popular. So. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, look, option two is our, our clear winner. It, it definitely received uh, the best feedback out of all of them. Uh, so we uh, are going to go ahead and go with option two and we will be uh, rebranding the website uh, and materials um, with the uh, second option going forward. Um, and if anybody would like um, that that logo uh, for use, um, just let us know and we will provide that to you. So thank you guys so much. Uh, it's super exciting. We just thought it would be a fun little thing for the annual meeting to give uh, the CUC a nice little facelift. And with that, I am going to pass it on to Rachel uh, to talk about House America. Thanks, Erin. Um, so I'm going to take uh, just a few minutes here um, for a PSA, a public service announcement. <laughs> um, so some of you may have already heard about the House America campaign. Um, some of you may have not. Um, a number of weeks ago, the Biden administration um, launched, formally launched the House America campaign. Um, they uh, held a virtual press conference that included um, the governor of Maine, the governor of California, uh, Gavin Newsom, 
um, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, HUD Secretary Fudd, Marsha Fudge, um, and they, they launched the How's America campaign. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that is. Um, ask you to reach out to me if you have any interest in talking more about it. But primarily what I'm gonna do is uh, make you aware of it and ask you to think about reaching out to your local uh, government officials, um, make them aware of it um, and see if we can get some movement on this here in our state. Um, so some of you may remember in 20, I know, I know many of you here do, um, Paula, Carrie, Marlena, uh, many of you were very involved in the, um, uh, folks in Dover were very involved in the effort to uh, end veteran homelessness. Um, uh, at that time, um, the federal government, um, HUD and the Veterans Administration made significant resources available um, to address the crisis of veteran homelessness specifically. Um, and they asked, uh, this was under the Obama administration, uh, Michelle Obama, um, then second lady, and our now second lady, um, then vice second lady, uh, Jill Biden, um, uh, went around the country asking folks to sign on to the mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness. Um, here in Delaware, we had a large rate of sign on. Um, our governor signed on, Our uh, some of our local mayors signed on, um, both uh, I know the mayor of Dover signed on um, and some other, some uh, local officials in Sussex County. So we had a lot of uh, buy-in and commitment and participation, both at the local and state levels. Um, so there were resources made available for that effort. And there was a very concerted local effort to organize our work to be able to reduce homelessness among veterans in our state. Um, as a result of those uh, increased investment of resources from the federal level to our state, as paired with local goal setting and coordination, like we set goals. In three months, we're going to house 50 homeless veterans. And here's who's going to do it. Remember, Paul? I see Paul going, yeah. I, I, like, I'm just having flashbacks, right? We set these really like <laughs> um, bold goals. And we had dedicated folks at the state level, at the local level, in our nonprofits, at the VA, working together to make that happen. And since that time, um, we have decreased veteran homelessness. Um, almost all, and I'm going to say almost because it is sometimes difficult to find everyone who may be sleeping outside in our state, um, since we're such a varied and vast geography. But almost all veterans who become homelessness in our state, the vast, vast majority of them, are quickly connected to safe shelter and uh, permanent housing resources that can help them, um, whether that's through the VA resources, HUD resources, and we continue to partner on that collaboration um, through tracking veteran homelessness. Um, here at Housing Alliance, we have staff that do that work every month. They pull reports. We have a by name list of homeless veterans in our state, and we continue to work with the Veterans Multi-Service Center, um, the Delaware Center for Homeless Veterans, Home of the Brave, and many others in our state to get folks uh, and veterans identified and quickly housed. Um, House America is similar um, in the sense that, and I, I talked so in detail about that because I wanted you guys to be thinking about what that looked like. And for those of you who participated, what was happening at the time, House America is a very similar initiative. It is the federal government asking communities to sign on to take on the challenge of rehousing people experiencing homelessness using a housing first approach and adding new units of affordable housing to the development pipeline, specifically using these large federal investments and resources. And they're saying mayors, the mayor of Philadelphia, Mayor Kenny has signed on and set goals um, for the city of Philadelphia in terms of how many households they're gonna rehouse that are currently homeless and how many new units of affordable housing they are going to create. Um, uh, I think Maine has signed on as a state um, in Birmingham, Alabama, the mayor has signed on. Um, so this is a national item. Um, and I just wanted to make you all aware and I'm happy to talk with anyone more about it. I've done some outreach to folks here at the city of Wilmington, um, at the governor's office um, and with some folks at Newcastle County. And I would love to hear if you are interested in helping me do that outreach to get our local officials prepared to take on this work. We have 
um, once in a generation, potentially once in a lifetime resources here through our ARP funds, our American Rescue Plan funds, um, both through HUD allocations um, in terms of vouchers, home funds, um, in terms of um, just the general relief dollars that can be used for affordable housing. Um, and so, as I said, the two goals are around housing creation, the number of new units of affordable or supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness that your community is going to add to the development pipeline, and the number of people experiencing homelessness that will be rehoused, um, and that you set these goals as a community and you dedicate your local resources to achieving them. Um, so that's all I'll say, and I'm going to let us move on. Um, that's my PSA. Um, the next slide is just going to provide you with a couple of additional, uh, a couple of links that will provide you with additional resources. So I know some and many of you have been attending local meetings with your local representatives or um, folks in your local community to think how can we use our resources to address this problem effectively. Um, on the House America website, um, you can find more information. Um, there are two documents that they provide there, 10 strategies to reduce homelessness using these dollars. Um, and how to make the most of the American Rescue Plan a guide to funding that you can use to make an impact on homelessness. So that is my public services announcement and I hope to talk with you all about that again soon. And I'm gonna hand it over to Marlena. Marlena, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, she's gonna provide us with an update on the Delaware Housing Assistance Program. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a couple of slides, but I don't think I'm going to use them. They are not like revolutionary um, and uh, just will kind of share some updates from DHAP. I'm not sure when we last did this, but um, probably I'm guessing at least a couple months. Um, and we have had a lot going on over the summer that I'm happy to and excited to share updates on. Um, just as a recap um, for anyone who's not familiar with the program already, um, we had started the DHAP program in March of 2020. Um, it was a very early, very quickly developed uh, program to provide emergency rental assistance for households affected by um, affected by the pandemic. And that program went through a couple of different iterations. Um, before there was new federal funding announced specifically for this purpose. Um, so that's the Federal Emergency Rental Assistance or ERA funding, which if you get any kind of national newsletters and things, I'm sure you have uh, seen talk about that um, there. And Delaware had a significant allocation um, from that funding. There were then two batches. So there was another, another allocation. Um, we are primarily working on the first one. Um, and the DHAT program was kind of relaunched in its third version, uh, March of 2021, um, with that new federal funding. Um, so there were some new federal requirements. Um, and we also had tried to, you know, kind of take feedback and understand things that were working and not working along the way. Um, so when we relaunched in March of this year, um, there were quite a few changes um, and a new new portal, new program guidelines, and a bunch of different things. Um, that operated um, through the summer, and over the summer, um, we did go through an upgrade to our application portal. Um, I will say, you know, when we when the federal ERA funding was first approved um, and announced. Um, it had a deadline of September of this year. Um, so I think, you know, how we look at a program that we think we're going to be running for, you know, seven or eight months is very different um, from how you might look at a program that you're going to be running for five years. Um, and so with the additional allocations and subsequent changes, um, the program, the second um, bucket of funding now goes through September of 2025. So it's a much longer term, longer term program. Uh, so over the summer, we made a change to our application portal um, that went up in early August. We also made quite a few changes to our program guidelines at the time um, as a new federal program with a lot of urgency around it. Um, Treasury has been kind of in constantly issuing um, new and revised guidance um, for the program and but you know can't change your program guidelines like every three weeks. Um, and there were a few things we had wanted to um, wanted to go back and add. Um, a significant one um, particularly was adding utilities uh, for renter households. Um, so that was added in August. Um, also the ability to request forward rent because um, the program can do up to 15 months of rent and up to three months of forward rent at a time. 
Um, we also added the ability to do security deposits, which is a significant change. Um, uh, updated our payment processing, uh, and we also made some operational changes for the program as well. So we added an external call center um, that has, I think, nine staff uh, working on that. It has all the usual call center bells and whistles of, you know, calls being recorded and, you know, detail on the wait times and topics and things like that. Um, that has been really helpful. I will, I will flag early on, um, the call center got very overwhelmed in the first couple of weeks. Um, and we had to significantly increase the pass capacity. So in those first couple of weeks, the wait times were long, but uh, all the reports I've seen more recently, they're, you know, under, they're like one to three minutes um, for the most part. Um, we also have uh, streamlined the documentation even more and are kind of continuously working, um, working on that. There are a lot of different documentation options, but I would say, you know, as a whole, it's minimal and you can do a complete and successful application with very little, very little documentation that's needed. Um, that does mean I think some of the program materials look a little complicated because there are a lot of different options. Um, we're kind of constantly trying to refine that and make sure that's as clear as possible um, so folks understand what they, what they really need to provide. Um, I think uh, a couple of key things I would highlight just to make sure everyone uh, is aware. Um, one is that folks do not have to be behind to apply. Um, we can do up to 15 months of assistance. Some folks are starting to hit that max, um, but just to keep that, um, that max in mind. Um, we can do late fees and court fees, uh, utilities that are due to the landlord, um, utilities that are um, uh, due to the utility company now as well, that is limited to electricity, gas, water, and wastewater. Um, so kind of the regulated utilities are what we, what we can cover utility-wise. Um, to share a little bit about our current status, um, I will say that the application volume went way up um, when our new portal reopened in early August, which we weren't totally expecting. You know, I think it had been kind of trending down over time. I think in late July, uh, especially, there were um, you know, there was a lot of press, there was a lot of attention to it, both at the federal level with the, the federal funding and also all the changes around the federal eviction moratorium, I think got us a lot of like extra free, free outreach there. And um, our application volume went up quite a bit. Our call center is generally handi handling around 300 plus calls a day. Um, we are working on both uh, previous applications that were trans, um, transition from our prior system and new applications. Um, and one thing we have been extremely focused on has been my kind of number one focus is um, building our review capacity um, so we can process those more quickly. We definitely, we are behind and have a backlog right now. Um, and we are working as quickly as we can to get through that and to increase the capacity so we can. Our target is to get to under 30 days from you know, point of application to, um, to paying the landlord. Um, we have added, and just to, to give you a sense of that, um, in the last couple of weeks um, and you know, additional coming on this week and more coming on in the future, um, have over 30 additional processors added. So we are really kind of turning that up. You know, we, it is our primary goal to get through these um, and get those moving more quickly. Um, we are also um, in touch frequently with the courts and recognizing that um, since we do have that backlog and some cases have been waiting a while, we frequently do not get those escalations. Um, if folks call our call center and say, you know, I have court next week or I have a utility cutoff next week, they escalate those and flag them um, to program management. Um, but if that doesn't happen, and it frequently doesn't, unfortunately, um, it doesn't, you know, we don't always don't always know about that. Um, so we are working with um, JP Court um, more closely to look at the look at the upcoming schedules, make sure that folks have gotten some communication, um, you know, if they have, have an upcoming hearing. So that would be something I would say too for those of you who are working with families and households, if there are issues like that, um, to definitely call the call center and flag and flag that and say that um, because we don't always have that on the application. You know, we have a yes, no box for if you have an eviction notice, but not that additional detail that can help tell us like, 
you know, oh, there's a hearing next week and there's already been two continuances, like it doesn't always give us that, um, that additional detail. Um, as far as what's next for the program, um, we are working on a batch of additional program guidelines updates. Um, one thing we have not done so far, but is allowed under the treasury guidance is making payments to tenants if the landlord refuses to participate. Um, so that's something we likely will be adding. Um, also, and a couple of other kind of documentation cleanup items, but that's a that's a big one. Um, and others are more kind of complicated things that perpetually come up and we realize need to need to be in the in the guidance. Um, also, we'll be turning up our outreach work um, more in the coming months and also are looking particularly at the housing stability services. So the federal ERA funding um, can be used for housing stability services and we're looking at how we can get more of that out uh, to help uh, you know, to help households apply, um, apply for DHAP and get that get that assistance. So there'll definitely be more news, um, more news about that in the coming weeks as well. And I have seen a ton of stuff like flying by in the chat. <laughs> so I will pop those up. Um. Marlena, I attempted to answer a few of them and I think oh, okay. I did. Um, so you could start with Terry, Terry's question. Um, Terry Williams. Okay. Uh, so both need to do something. Either one can start it. Um, who can complete, who is to complete the application, the tenant, the landlord, or both. Uh, so either can start it. Um, whoever starts it, the other party will get a, an invitation, um, a text or email or both um, for them to come log in and do their side of the application. Um, so yeah, either one can start. Uh, the HAP acronym, Delaware Housing Assistance Program, which, you know, <laughs> if, if starting over again, we might change, might change the name, but once we had it, we stuck with it um, and didn't want to like rebrand along the way. Marlena, in the interest of time, um, we do still have um, two presentations okay. and a training to get through. Um, okay. Anybody who has questions, I would encourage them to continue to keep putting them in the chat um, and then uh, we can all follow up afterwards. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Marlena. Mm -hmm. um, next, I would like um, to open it up to Tony Serzega from Community Legal Aid Society, um, who is going to be giving us an update on evictions in Delaware. Hey, uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, and just to uh, basically, I'm gonna run through um, kind of the trends of what we're seeing um, in terms of evictions. Uh, and a lot of the data comes from Princeton's eviction lab and, and from JP Court itself. Um, so during the, um, the statewide moratorium, uh, we saw virtually no new eviction cases filed. Um, but since the moratorium has been lifted, um, we're seeing an increase in filings, but are still below the normal historical levels um, that ranged, you know, were, that were pretty similar from as far back as 2016 through uh, January and February of 2020. Um, so what we've looked at most recently, um, we've taken data from July through October of 2019, um, and we're, we've seen eviction uh, filing numbers ranging between um, at, at a minimum um, as low as 131 with um, a high as 673 in, in a number of weekly cases filed. Um, and the actual evictions during this time range from as low as 33 to as high as 81. Um, and the, uh, like I said, these numbers have been historically uh, similar, you know, but from the, as far back as 2016 through uh, February of 2020. Um, during that same time period of July through October of 2021, um, case filings have remained lower with a uh, range as low as 46 cases uh, filed to a high of 320, uh, which, which came the, uh, during the last week of September. Um, evictions uh, have ranged between a low of 19 with a high of 48 uh, in a given week. Um, so in total, uh, since, since March 15th of 2020, uh, we're looking at 6,667 uh, cases filed. Um, so while uh, we haven't seen a return to the 2019 numbers um, or the, you know, the numbers that have been that we've historically seen, you know, from 2016 to 2020, uh, we are seeing some of our highest filings um, in September and October. Um, I can say anecdotally, um, I've had very few issues connecting clients with DHAP. 
um, and connecting, you know, and, and through that, connecting them with their landlord um, to, to make sure that the DHAP money is, is, you know, being used and being put to work. Um, so that, you know, kind of keeps me hopeful in terms of, you know, our ability uh, with our different organizations to work together to make sure that we're connecting our clients um, to that available funding um, and, you know, to keep ourselves as, as low, you know, as far away from those pre-2020 historical numbers as possible. Um, so with that, that that's pretty much the, the update I had. Um, if anybody has any questions or, you know, more you know, information, I, I would point you, you know, obviously ask anything in the chat, but I'd also point you specifically to the Eviction Lab uh, website. Um, they have, you know, very, you know, interesting and, and, and the data is, is very timely in terms of what's going on in Delaware. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tony. All right. Um, so next, uh, we are going to um, open it up to Jennifer Kai from the Community Legal Aid Society uh, to talk about connecting clients to the child tax credit. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jenny Kay. I'm a supervising attorney at Classy. I do fair housing and public benefits work. And I'm going to give a brief overview on the child tax credit today. And I've been told we're running out of time, so I'll try to make this quick. Um, so there is a lot of money available for our clients right now in the form of stimulus checks and the child tax credit. Uh, and I'm not going to talk a lot about stimulus checks in this presentation, but you should know that it's not too late for people to claim those checks. And we'll talk more about how to do that later on. So for tax year 2021, Congress significantly expanded the child tax credit. And, and the most important change is that people with little to no income or earnings are eligible for this child tax credit for the first time. And that's why it's such a big deal for us. Um, the only problem is that many of our clients, uh, they are non-tax filers because they're not required to file taxes. You're only required to file taxes if you make over $12,400. And so because a lot of our clients are not filers, they won't get the child tax credit automatically and they'll have to take some extra steps to get this money. Uh, and the other change is that families can get some of this money in advance this year in monthly payments. And then the child tax credit also comes with uh, larger payments. So this slide just shows what it will look like for a family to get the child tax credit. Uh, families will get half of their child tax credit in advance in monthly payments that arrive somewhere around the 15th of the month. And then they will get the second half of their credit next year after they file a tax return next year. And something to keep in mind is that even if people claim the child tax credit later, that doesn't mean that they're going to lose out on any payment. Uh, so if let's say a client doesn't claim the child tax credit until next year, she would just get the entire $6,600 credit in one lump sum next year. So uh, this is a really important point. Child tax credit payments will not affect people's eligibility for public benefits or housing assistance like Medicaid, SSI, TANF, SNAP, Section 8. Child tax credit payments are not considered income for these programs. Um, if families still have this money after a year and they haven't spent it within 12 months, at that point, it may be considered a resource. Uh, this is also another important point because in our client communities, there are some misconceptions that if people try to get the child tax credit, that they're somehow going to owe the IRS money in the future. But that is not true. This money is not a loan. People won't have to repay the government. And this money also is not taxable. Um, so this slide just outlines the major eligibility factors. Uh, for getting the child tax credit, the adult claiming the credit must have a social security number or an ITIN, and they also can't be claimed as a dependent on someone else's taxes. Um, and as for children, 
Um, something to keep in mind is that this child tax credit isn't just for families where parents are taking care of their own kids. It can include um, families where grandparents are taking their, care of their grandchildren or an aunt is taking care of nephews. So all of those families are potentially eligible for the child tax credit. So in order to get the child tax credit payments, the IRS needs to have people's information. And so for people who already filed a tax return for 2019 or 2020, they are likely already getting the advanced payments. But for a lot of our clients, like I said, they are non-filers. And for, for them, I would encourage them to use GetCTC, which is a new tool that launched in September. And this tool allows people to file a simplified federal tax return that gives the IRS enough information to send these families the child tax credit payments. Uh, you can also use this tool to claim the stimulus checks. It's, Get CTC is not exclusively for the child tax credit. And Get CTC, it closes November 15th. So I would encourage your clients to use it as soon as possible. It will reopen probably next year, but things are still up in the air about when exactly that will happen. And this is what the GetCTC tool looks like. It was designed to be as easy to use as possible. It's available in both English and Spanish. And people can also use the tool on their phones so they don't need a computer um, to access it. And this is the information that people need for the GetCTC tool. Um, it's pretty basic information. And as long as people have this information on hand, the tool is supposed to take around 20 minutes to complete. Uh, Classy, we have our own URL for the GetCTC tool. So if you have clients who need to use GetCTC, um, please encourage them to use this URL. It allows us to see how many people we're reaching through presentations like this one, and it allows us to generate some helpful data. So that was everything that I had. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and also, if you have social media, please follow Classy on Facebook and Twitter because we post updates on the child tax credit. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. All right, everybody, for the remainder of today's meeting, um, we are actually going to be offering a, a training to um, all of the CUC members um, on community inclusion and homeless recovery. Um, so Rob Weatherington from Pathways to Housing PA uh, is going to take it over from here. Thank you so much for uh, just let us be here. I'm, I'm also joined with Zach Hill, uh, who's uh, also going to be sharing. Uh, and we're going to talk for a little bit. So let me just pull up this uh, shared screen here. And we'll try and go quick because I know that we're uh, eating into some time. And I want to make sure that we get to cover all the fun things we have going on today. Um, but the big thing is, we're just so honored to be here uh, to be able to share with you all and to be a part of this today. Uh, just hearing what's going on with the Delaware Continuum of Care uh, is just really exciting. Uh, and so just thank you so much for uh, Felicia organizing this and, and getting us on board here today. And then uh, also just thank you for all the amazing work that you're all doing. It's just so uh, encouraging and exciting to hear whenever great work is happening that we're not usually exposed to. So uh, this is just wonderful. Uh, audio sounds good. And I'm sharing my screen. We can see what's good. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah, so community inclusion and homelessness recovery. This is kind of a, a thing that uh, Zach and I have been working on for a little over a year. But we're going to just share some, some training real quick on what this can look like. Um, but the, the quick and dirty is that uh, housing people is really where the hard work starts. And how do you help people reclaim lives uh, after they've been homeless for a long time? and then uh, engage in the community like everybody else. So uh, we're Rob, gonna go over. Rob, yeah. I'm gonna jump in for just one second and let you know that the screen that we're seeing is um, kind of, the PowerPoint's kind of small. 
Is there a way for you to make the PowerPoint full screen or is it maybe, is it just me? I just wanted to make sure folks could see your materials. Yeah. Um, like we can kind of see all of, there you go. That's perfect. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go over community inclusion and how that's really uh, a key part of uh, housing first and, and uh, helping connect people to um, apartments and ending homelessness. We're gonna understand the impact of social isolation on health and well-being uh, and how essentially um, more and more people are talking about community inclusion being a, uh, a medical intervention and how important that is to addressing isolation for both physical and mental health. And then uh, we're gonna go over the 12 domains of community inclusion uh, and the relevance in um, connecting, uh, addressing that. So yeah, uh, we're gonna try and stick uh, to our time. We're gonna save questions for the end. We have a little spot there for, for some dialogue and discussion. So um, let's see here, as I'm trying to figure out juggling these screens. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to take some time to talk about high fidelity housing first, uh, and we're going to set up this as a framework for our discussion. Um, we're not going to go super in depth with housing first because we assume everybody here knows what that is, uh, but just to help, uh, you know, frame our conversation. And then also we're going to uh, go over some of the principles of recovery, uh, specifically from SAMHSA, uh, and then we're going to talk about community inclusion, which would be um, you know, we help people on a clinical team live a life of quality uh, and the importance of connecting people uh, to the community and how, how that impacts and results in greater outcomes. Uh, towards the end, we'll have a spot for some questions and discussion. Um, yeah, normally this would be a little different. We'd be in person, uh, you know, in a big room talking, but uh, we've been making some adjustments uh, as everybody has in, in this virtual world. So. Um, yeah, thanks for bearing with us on the on uh on all that. So let's see here. I am Rob Weatherington. I started working with uh, homeless adults in uh, 2007. Um, and let's see here. Uh, it's, I started with the arts and then kind of built into some more uh, creativity, creative ways to, to connect with people. Uh, and I have a Master of Arts in Urban Studies with an emphasis in community development. Um, they're really trying to figure out how to draw people uh, from the fringes into uh, a connection. You know, the, ultimately the city is the loneliest place, right? We're surrounded by people, but we're unknown and, and disconnected. So uh, over the past 15 years or so, I've worked from, with uh, children and families in shelters. Um, I've had pretty much every position uh, imaginable from uh, the, the whole the whole way all the way to where I am now as director of community inclusion advocacy, which is uh, kind of a fun uh, creative thing that Pathways has made up um, to help us do this kind of work. Uh, yeah, I started working in the education field and then just got drawn to helping people. I've always been in the helping field and, and, and found a way to get into it here. Um, so yeah, so that's me and I'm going to toss it over to Zach, who's our uh, I'll let him talk for a little bit. I've rambled some. Everyone uh, hear me all right? Am I coming through? Awesome. Yep. Um, I'm Zach Hill. I'm the uh, coordinator for alumni and advocacy services at Pathways to Housing. I came to Pathways in 2019, worked on some of the clinical teams as a service coordinator. Um, and now I'm running our advocacy and alumni programming, which I'll talk a little bit about a little later. Um, yeah, I, I started working with homeless adults in maybe about 2016 in undergrad um, in Baltimore. And yeah, I'm very excited to be here as well. So like Rob said, I think we're gonna start with talking a little bit about housing first. Um, it's basically step one for us, um, housing first, right? It's the most important thing that we do, um, but it's the most straightforward part. Everything that uh, comes after kind of makes it more successful. Um, it takes a lot of time 
when we're targeting really vulnerable people with extended time on the street, maybe they've had experiences in the system for a long time. They've heard it all, right? They've been through all these systems that have kind of failed them. Um, so it takes a lot to, to build that rapport and to get them to trust the program and to come inside. Um, so we're, we're, if I'm thinking about somebody that I moved in from the street, it could take several different interactions, right? Somebody's going to tell me like, no, I don't believe you. No, I don't trust you. Understandably. Um, but it's about building that rapport and building that trust so they'll come in. Um, and then what comes after, making the house a home, modeling good choices, all the services that follow, it's about empowering them, expanding their locus of control um, and really engaging the service participant, activating them as a, a member in their own treatment team. They're the ones leading their services. They're the ones making the decisions for, for how they wanna engage. Um, it's not about making decisions for people, forcing them to do things. I think about one person that I house. Um, he had a lot of uh, trauma in medical uh, experiences, didn't trust doctors, didn't want to engage in any of that, but had extremely high blood pressure. And we were trying to get him to engage with that. Um, and I would spend, you know, an hour with him at his apartment, just sitting there. We'd play some music. Um, we were shooting hoops in his backyard one day and I noticed he was getting kind of out of breath. And I was like, Hey man, like, you ever think about taking some blood pressure medicine? Like for, you know, if you want to be out here shooting hoops. And that was when we really started to talk about it when he could be like, you know, we have this relationship. This is about like the things that I want to do in my life. This isn't going to a service provider and having them scold me or whatever, or telling me how to live my life. It's, it's relational work, you know, none of us got into this field because we want to fill out uh, assessments or goal plans, uh, Excel spreadsheets, you know, we're in the business of working with people and helping with people. It's about building, building relationships. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important things about what we do and also kind of one of the hardest things to, to do a training or codify or, or put in a process is like, how do you build a relationship with someone? How do you, uh, you know, engage with someone socially? And a lot of it is, is even harder when we get into, you know, professional boundaries or uh, we get, we get kind of muddled. Uh, and I don't want to say, I don't want to toss this out the window because they're exceptionally important, but there is a dance that has to happen and we have to use some, some good um, thoughtful consideration and, you know, how much do I share about myself and how much do I engage with this uh, program participant and try and help build this rapport? Because when we get into some of these hard spots, it's going to be much more important to have uh, a flow, a give and take. And that's also what's going to help model what a healthy relationship looks like. And that's really like our role in a lot of different ways. Uh, and we'll get into this more, but we're, we're the people, you know, we're the ones that, that uh, a lot of, uh, the, the people that we work with, um, we're not out to get anything from them. We're not out to take advantage of them. We're genuinely there to connect and to help uh, build them up. And um, it's kind of weird, you know. That's not that's not the norm in a lot of uh, relationships that that uh, our population uh, engages with. Um, but over and over again, our mantra is that uh, recovery is possible. Um, the system isn't really built for that. You know, the system is built to meet a need, an immediate need. And a lot of times it seems like that need lasts into, you know, perpetuity and forever. Um, and that people aren't capable of movement and change and growth and development. Uh, and I've seen it, you've seen it. Let's just say it, you know, recovery is possible. People change over time. And it's, you know, we can, uh, you know, bemoan some of the bureaucratic kind of stuff that gets in the way, or we can just acknowledge that um, we need some, sometimes we got to be encouraged to uh, look for more. And so, you know, I, I've worked with uh, some people and uh, one guy in particular was talking about uh, rehabilitation. And he was like, hey, you guys keep talking about how I'm going to, you know, you want me to uh, rehabilitate. I, I need ability. I need to, 
I need to ability, right? Like, I don't know how to wash dishes. I never had an apartment before. I grew up, uh, you know, my mom wasn't home. My family wasn't connected. Like, I, I didn't learn any of this stuff. And so, uh, you know, he was saying that he was lucky to sweep his, his kitchen, right? Like, he even remember to do that because he'd never had a kitchen before, let alone one that he needed to sweep. And so uh, that kind of put a lot of stuff in perspective for me in particular that um, sometimes we, we, you know, for some of our participants, some of the people that we serve, we got to bring it down to the base levels of what it means to exist in an independent living and kind of tamper some of our uh, expectations for what, how people are going to engage with that. But also like people want to learn how to do dishes. They want that normalcy, uh, that regular everyday pace that uh, maybe all of us take for granted and what that looks like. But people we serve can change. Uh, and, and our job is really to be kind of like um, cheerleaders to encourage that change. A lot of times, uh, you know, the way that we deal with trauma can, can also affect the culture of, of an agency. And we can bring that into uh, the encounters that we have with participants um, and, and kind of if we're not on top, if we're not on top of it, we can we can it can be detrimental. We can hurt people, and uh, I don't think that's what anybody nobody is in this training is out to hurt people. Uh, and so just being aware of that, and that you know, I've been in some clinical uh, settings where the way that we deal with a lot of trauma is uh, through some pretty dark humor, uh, and then at some point uh, that hope atrophies and has a hard way of getting through that darkness. Uh, and I've had to be really conscious of that specifically when uh, I've seen the it impact uh, client services. Um, recovery for me might not look like recovery for you. It might not look like recovery for, for specific participants. And nobody caught that. And so uh, just celebrating the little wins. Um, one of my favorite movies is uh, What About Bob? Uh, if you haven't seen it and you're in mental health care, Go watch What About Bob, talks about the baby steps. Uh, that's a, I talk about that with my therapist all the time, uh, that, you know, these little things that I do that, that, uh, that our participants do, we need to celebrate them. Uh, and, and everything is just, um, not everything is going to be this big over-the-top ticker tape parade, uh, release the high school band uh, marching parade. It's, it's uh, these little things that, that get to happen. Um, but also a lot of that is, is um, you know, I, I had one participant uh, a while back that just didn't understand that you don't put um, grease down the drain. I'm, wa I'm washing the dishes, I'm doing the thing I'm supposed to, but the plumber has to keep coming. Like, yeah, you can't put the grease down there. Um, you know, we've had, we've had folks uh, get infestations because they don't understand that you can't bring an old mattress into your apartment. Like, this is not what we're doing anymore. Uh, and being able to, to bring it down and kind of like start reset and just talk about it um, and help people understand uh, the different things that you need to do in, in your own place. Uh, so we got to find that balance, supporting someone regardless of the mistakes that they've, that they've made and also not doing everything for them because it's easier that way, right? Like uh, we don't want to do anything to or for people. We want to help bolster that, that independence. Uh, but often uh, in the mental health system, we have a tendency to uh, do a little too much, and it's kind of hard to break break the shackles of, of the warm embrace, right, to help people uh, gain their legs and be a little more independent, uh, depending on that. So anyways, we, we also want to be respectful uh, of addressing trauma. Uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, the the ways that people have, have been treated in the past, the ways that they've been uh abuse in, in a lot of instances, the way that they've, um, you know, a lot of that can stem from and comes from uh, their housing situations as, as they were younger or uh, different things like that. So just making sure that uh, as we start to begin encouraging this independence, that we're, we are aware that we're unlocking different levels of trauma. And we want to make sure that there's uh, places to talk about what this looks like um, and, and, you know, putting some of these expectations on people uh, some participants, the, the only expectations they've ever had has been, uh, you know, there's there's been some pain or abuse or trauma that's been linked to that. So uh, we want to, some of the steps and layers and things we're talking about today, uh, 
we want to go at people's own pace. We don't want to be surprised when somebody, you know, makes two steps forward and goes one step back. We don't want to punish people uh, directly or indirectly when kind of like that's the natural process, right? Like you make some steps, you fall back a little and, and, and we have this uh, elasticity of development and, and we, and we got to, make space for that and also help our staff understand and make space for that. And that, that might really be uh, one of the key parts of, of helping understand that recovery is possible is that um, helping our staff and the, and the people that we work next to and, and around and with not take things personally. Um, somebody didn't pick up again because of something that you did. Somebody didn't, uh, you know, stop taking their meds because of you. Um, it's just part of the process. It's something that happens. And we have, we have better outcomes when we uh, uh, align with the parts, program participants and, and walk alongside them instead of pointing fingers or blaming or any of that stuff. Um, so principles of recovery, this is real quick. You're probably familiar with these uh, if you've been in this field for any amount of time, but SAMHSA uh, defines them in, in you know, this list here that you can uh, look at. I'm not going to go through every single one of them here, but uh, these are developed in regards to mental health. Uh, it can be acceptable to all kinds of areas of recovery, and that's areas of, of all, all kinds of recovery, and we're all in it in different ways at different times, uh, but it's essentially, you know, reclaiming one's life um, from some, some, some outside force that, that makes it hard to do the things that you want to do when you want to do them, uh, and that could be eating, shopping, drugs, mental health, and any of that stuff, uh, but also homelessness. Uh, and some of the trauma and stigma that, that lasts in people's lives over time, uh, you know, we help people overcome and uh, thrive in, in reclaiming their lives uh, by embracing these tenets in regards to homelessness recovery. Uh, it's not easy, it's relational, and all relationships are messy. Uh, it is human. And it is difficult. Uh, and so one of the easy things to do, and I think Zach tapped on this a second ago, none of us got in this field to do a piece of paper, like to have somebody on another side of a desk and tap a, write a piece of paper, uh, sign this, do that, let's do this next thing. All of that is for um, compliance. And we have, to, we have to remain compliant. We have to show funders and everybody that work that we're doing has an outcome. Uh, but we also need to be vigilant that that doesn't turn into the work that we do. Uh, because it's not fun or edifying or exciting for us or for the people that we're here to serve. Um, but people are more than the labels that are placed upon them. And maybe we're not actively placing the labels on them, but we have to help them understand that the labels that society placed on them over and over again aren't, aren't what defines them, whether that be from their addiction, their mental health diagnosis, from being unhoused, uh, from their you know, sexuality, from their race, from gender, any of that stuff, they are who they are, and they are important and celebrated. Uh, and just to be that rallying call over and over again to remove the stigma and to help people we serve see themselves as full humans, worthy of all the good things in life. Uh, and that will not only increase positive outcomes and services, but it'll also help propel staff. They're kind of a, a bureaucratic doldrums that often results in burnout. And so if you can tap into positive interactions with participants, um, even if it's just tiny little good baby steps that are, that are happening, uh, that's going to help at the end of the day, especially, uh, you know, when we have a really hard day. And if, and if you're doing any kind of work like Zach and I and your agency is anything like it, there are really, really rough, hard, beat down days, and there are some really great ones too. And we just want to, uh, you know, celebrate that over and over again. I think that one of the biggest ones here is recovery is based on respect. Respect is dependent on identifying the humanity of the individual. A lot of times in service, uh, service work that we do, people are uh, infantized and, you know, um, spoken down to. We work with full grown adults that make their own decisions. We might not always agree with those decisions, but that's not our job. Our job is to ride along in those decisions uh, and to help where we can, you know, sometimes they're going to make some choices that are out of our hands uh, and, th and they're going to wind up dealing with some natural um, consequences of those choices. But ultimately, it's what it is. Uh, and that's the work. Maybe that's 
the hard work that we got to keep digging into every day is to, is to uh, respect and celebrate the individuals that we are uh, we feel called and led to, to work with every day um yeah so these people that we work with um we can get caught up in the day to day and forget who these people are they draw from rich experiences uh they have lived full autonomous lives forever sitting across the table from us uh they make those independent choices and our role is to support and encourage i've worked with people who were really early on like computer programmers like in the late 70s early 80s um who had mental health crises and wound up receiving services i've worked with people who are published authors uh who are celebrated uh at the height of their careers and you know, different things happen in their life and in their mental health, and they wound up uh, being on the street. Respected university professors uh, from UPenn who, um, you know, they just wound up where they are. One guy in particular uh, was drawn a dual, um, dual pension. He had been a firefighter, had a whole career as a firefighter in Philadelphia, and then uh, retired from that, went on to be a teacher was getting a full pension and was just his mental health just didn't allow him to, to engage and interact to, to the point where he lost an eye. He, had, he got an infection in his eye, wouldn't get treatment, uh, and he, he wound up having to get it, get that removed. We had to get really creative to engage with people so that they would actually like access services. This guy in particular, we had to send one of our maintenance guys over uh, to be a laser removal specialist. And so he was convinced that there were lasers in his apartment and he wasn't going to move in until we removed uh, because there were lasers in there. And so we had uh, one of our maintenance guys put on a white Tyvek suit, go in with some aluminum foil and uh, move it around, put it here, put it there. We got rid of the lasers. You're totally good. And he was set. He moved right in and was excited to be there. Uh, and that's when he was able to start getting the services. He had his eye removed and, uh, we were able to actually save his life from an from a infection spreading to his brain that he otherwise wasn't going to be able to do. Um, that's kind of the work that we do, right? Like that's the weird, creative, exciting things that, that we do, but also these baby steps specifically for this guy who um, was able to reconnect with his family after that and, and, and do those kinds of things. So respecting people uh, and, and celebrating their, their independence. Zach, I'm going to pass it to you as, as you share a little bit about uh, the hierarchy of needs that I'm sure everybody's familiar with, but I made this great graphic, so you got to look at it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure folks are familiar with the hierarchy of needs, um, starting with the more like basic physiological needs, going up to more specific self-actualization. Um, like Rob's been talking about, we're engaging with people as whole humans, whole individuals with whole complex lives and histories and um, relationships and and everything. Um, so like I was saying before, like getting them housed is just one part of their whole like complex life, like providing the safety and shelter of having the actual apartment, having the team uh, case management services uh, to get connected with benefits, get connected with physical and mental health, um, start thinking about recovery. Those are kind of the bottom level pyramid stuff. And that stuff, I'm not discounting that that stuff takes up the majority of case management time sometimes for our folks, especially. I mean, it, it qualifying for our program isn't easy, right? When I when we tell people, you know, you're at a party, they ask, what do you do? Uh, housing first. Uh, we, help people get off the street. We get them in apartments with no preconditions. I hear one of two responses. It's either, where do I sign up? That sounds great. Or two, you can't just give people apartments. Like, what do you mean? And so two things. One, it's not, you're not, <laughs> you don't want that. You don't want to be at a point in your life that this is what you get because um, it's complicated and hard. Um, and two, it's not just providing housing, right? We provide all the other services in addition to connecting with resources, connecting with, you know, getting their benefits and getting their health appointments and everything. Once they're actually stably housed in a safe spot, everything else in their life is where community inclusion comes in. Um, it's what comes after, like housing first is how I think of it, community inclusion second, at least, maybe. I don't know if that's the order I would put it in. Um, but it's about 
it's the developing positive relationships, sense of belonging, um, trying new activities, connecting to yourself, <clears throat> your self-esteem, trying stuff out, um, learning. I'm, so we do a lot of uh, community inclusion events. And I think folks at our agency sometimes think of it as just like a fun outing. You know, we'll go bowling, we'll go to the park, we go to a Phillies game, but it's not just about having a good time. You know, it's about budgeting time and money. It's about being accountable to a group of people. If you say you're going to be somewhere and showing up, um, it's about interacting with other people in a positive way. Maybe building relationships with people with common interests. Maybe you find out you both like to shoot pool and you go shoot pool and then you become part of that community. And you have this entire other group of people that you're engaging with. And this all, this is life in between the, sorry, my cat's going to keep jumping on me. Life that happens in between, you know, the biweekly home visit that your service coordinator does. It's everything else. Life outside of the apartment that they're in or coming into our office, everything else that happens in their life, that's all the community inclusion stuff. Um, for example, employment, which is something we do in our, our department, can be a bridge between that kind of safety uh, needs and connecting it to you know love and belonging and esteem you're building relationships with other people, building self-esteem and your time. Um, and when the participants leading this and doing all this heavy lifting, uh, that's when self-actualization starts to come in, wanting to do more, you know, self-improvement, being their best self. Um, but a barrier that comes up in, in community inclusion that we see a lot in our population that we're engaging with is isolation, which Rob is gonna talk about next. Yeah, and I mean, this is a. Normally, we're we're not we're not talking to service providers at such a large level, but I'm I'm sure you're familiar with the social model of disability, where you can dig back deep into you know grad school and, and remember that or uh, undergrad. But essentially, it's it's that uh, the reason that we that the social model is that the, the our society is not built for people with a disability, and that's really easy to address when it comes to like ADA compliance for wheelchairs. Uh, it gets a little more difficult when your disability is mental health uh, or you know when there's a co-occurring mental health and substance use or any of that stuff that those disabilities are, are more difficult to uh, to identify and address and, and for society itself to, to uh, even accept. You know we um, are more and more disconnected uh, you know Community connections have been atrophying in, in the U.S. for over 50 years, if not longer. Uh, and I don't know if we've ever been further away from each other than in this moment. And I mean, I could go, I could risk for a little bit off slides in my notes about just the impact of COVID and, you know, the videos that you see from Spirit Airlines or whatever, like where people are just like wiling out in a way that I've never seen before across like the country. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with this isolation. You get so alone. And you have your thoughts and you have your recurring thoughts and you just get siloed and you just keep going over and over and over and over again until no one can really get in. You're convinced hundred percent of whatever it is that you're, you're working with. And uh, we've seen how that plays out in a lot of different ways, either in the services that we do, or maybe if your uncle is like mine and is just like, I don't even know the guy. Anyways. Um, but that isolation uh, specifically when it comes to mental health issues and substance use, uh, one of the biggest things that we've we've tackled over the years of, of doing the housing first that, that we do is um, we put somebody into an apartment and then we don't see them for a little while. Like that 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 can be rough and difficult. Um, you know, especially if you're just waiting for the bi-weekly interaction. A lot of stuff happens in two weeks. And if you're just sitting there watching Mari, waiting for the next home visit, it's not really a life worth living, right? Um, and I've gotten into some conversations over the years with some people that say, like, I think I was better off sitting under the bridge. Well, yeah, maybe you had more people that were around you, uh, but also like, let's go do something. Let's go connect and find new people and make new friends and make new peers. Uh, and a lot of times that's something that gets lost in the shuffle of the day to day uh, in the work that we do. So one, people living with disability, uh, our society is not built for them, especially when it's mental health disability. People living with a psychiatric disability have 50% less social connections than somebody not not with a, with a psychiatric disability. So you see 50% less people. And of those 50%, uh, 
So half of that half uh, are paid to interact with them. So it's people like me and you that are seeing these folks that are living with these disabilities. We carry, we have such a heavy burden. We have such great impact on people's lives. And I think it's something that a lot of times we don't even consider that, uh, you know, um, if you see five, if, if somebody is living without a psychiatric disability sees, you know, four people in a day, somebody with a psychiatric disability seeing two people in that day, one of those people is paid to interact with them. That's a doctor, that's a case manager, that's, you know, somebody uh, on a payroll. And so when we think about those kinds of things, um, we, we play a, a significant role in participant flies, whether they want to uh, agree with that or not. And then maybe sometimes folks come into your office and, and are really upset and angry and, and say and yell and act out in a lot of different ways. That's because they feel safe doing that with us. Uh, and they can't get away with that on their corner. They can't get away with that uh, at somebody else's house. But they can come here and they feel like they have that control and that power. Uh, and the understanding of what control and power is is very different. So helping people you know, reset, realign, use a different lens to see those things. All of that is the hard work that, that uh, comes with community inclusion and comes with engaging with folks in that love and belonging and in that um, uh, esteem portion. Um, so yeah, partnering, partnering with program participants and activating them to be members of the treatment team is key to addressing uh, this love and belonging and this esteem. Um, and it goes back to that trust, and those relationships, and that encouragement. They come in and yell at you in the office because you're the one that it's safe to yell at. And maybe in the bulk of their relationships that they've ever had, that's all they know is yelling. That's what passion is. That's what connection is. You only yell at people that you love. Uh-oh, you care about me. Now you're going to place yell at me because that's, that's what you've learned. Um, so not making excuses for that. But there is some reason behind it, and, and our job is to help people tweak that and change that and learn how to, how to connect and communicate differently. And a lot of that comes from the modeling that we do uh, as professionals. Um, so yeah, we're helping people who actively explore these areas and develop these skills, sometimes for the first time. And that means have, that we got to do a lot of deconstruction. we got to do a lot of rebuilding. Uh, and this is the kind of rehabilitation that has to be done in partnership. You got to do it together. You can't do it to or for somebody. Uh, as much as as easier as it would be to just like crack them open and swirl the thing around and close up, and now they're you know engaging uh, and less stressful. And you know when they come into the office, that's where the real work happens. But also that's where the real rewards occur. Also, uh, and seeing somebody who's making even the slightest step into a new direction uh, is great for them, and it's also great uh, for us. And some of this is also hard when working with people who have a history of being in unhoused, uh, specifically in the homeless services uh, culture, right? A lot of times, uh, if somebody is receiving services uh, and they are unhoused, it's a drop-in culture. It's a, it's, I come when I come, I don't come when I don't come, and, and you know what, you're going to be there next week anyway. So I'll pop in when I pop in. We need to use our um, influence or our power to kind of address that dropping culture. Uh, yeah, there is a time and a need for that, specifically at that lower level of physiological safety sort of stuff and the hierarchy of needs. But once we're in this relationship and we're building towards something new, specific like treatment plan with the participants, helping them understand that like they are important and that they belong, and they are needed. And when they're not there, they're missed. These are, these are messages that people might not be getting outside of your office. And if you're not the one that's saying it, remember, you're the one person that they might be seeing that day. They're not going to hear it. Uh, and instead, what they're going to hear is 30, 40 years of, of a family of origin and all the messed up stuff that's happened to them, the trauma that's happened to them in the past. So our job is to shine that light of, of belonging and, and shine it uh, brightly over and over again. We've got to be aware of what our workspace is conveying. Uh, you know, a sense of belonging is not communicated in a hospital. A sense of belonging is not communicated in a prison. Those aren't inherent places where you belong. Those are places that are meeting an immediate need or they're like punishing somebody, right? And so 
do we have a warm and welcoming office environment? Or is it a, uh, you know, a cold, sterile, uh, spray it down with Lysol after somebody leaves the room kind of setup? These are things that are um, communicated verbally or non-verbally with people who are uh, seeking help and that we are, you know, passionate about working with. We also got to work with uh, the whole person and, and holistically as we're helping them develop a, a self-esteem. Uh, and so it isn't just the um, whatever's on the primary goal plan for that day and we got to turn the paper in. Sometimes we got to have harder, more difficult conversations. Sometimes we got to dig in deep. Uh, and sometimes we got to be really honest about the fact that like, it's hard to do some of this work when we have such high turnover uh, of service coordinators and case managers. And why would somebody want to go deep with somebody when they're going to leave? Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's happening uh, in all of that. So we need to be aware of that and help not only not only ourselves be aware of that, but I think helping convey that to our staff and the importance of of, uh, of how far that can go and what that can really do. Um, a lot of the information that we have and a lot of the, the, the things that we've been citing come from the Temple Collaborative for Community Inclusion. We're very lucky that uh, Dr. Mark Salzer is, is on our board of directors and has been a, a big advocate for community inclusion with Pathways to Housing PA. And also that we've had been able to work very closely with uh, his research partner, Rick Barron, uh, and that um, he's one of my mentors and somebody that I really look up to. Um, I think it was probably like 2012 or 2013, I just started working at Pathways and then met Rick Barron. He was talking about uh, getting the people that we work with uh, employed. And I have the notes somewhere, but I wrote down, this guy's a nut. Our people can't work. Why would we do that? Uh, and then over time, and more training and more understanding, I came to understand that not only can our people work, but they can thrive in a competitive employment environment. Um, might take a little bit longer to find the right place. It might take a little bit longer to find the right employer. Um, but by and large, employers don't care about your diagnosis. They want to know, are you going to show up and give it your best? Wow, that's pretty easy when it comes down to it. Uh, and there's a lot of flexibility uh, from employers when it comes to that. So over here on the slide, these are basically the domains of community inclusion. I've kind of divided it up. What's on the left side to be more of like what is um, – more defined by, by social service organizations and agencies, things like that, that are kind of easier to, de like, not so muddled. Uh, and the ones on the right get a little more muddled and a little more difficult. Maybe if, if we're, you know, very staunchly clinical, uh, a lot of those things can pop off and not ever be discussed, right? And so housing and health and wellness, we do a lot of that here. Pathways to Housing is kind of in our name. Uh, we also have a clinic on site. We, we address uh, mental health, we address physical health, um, and maybe you do too. Finances and peer supports are really easy to identify and say like, what's we're gonna get into. Employment and education. Some of the harder stuff, religion and spirituality. Uh, our people have beliefs. The people that we serve have beliefs and, and we can either know them and, and get to understand them or we can totally ignore that that exists in any capacity whatsoever. I think we'll have better outcomes if we just ask some questions to get to know what somebody believes. That doesn't mean that we need to like get into some kind of like wild argument or something that gets uncomfortable or something that's just like uh, inappropriate to discuss or anything like that. But finding out what somebody believes is, is, is a vulnerability. Uh, and that's like a, a really easy nugget to start, uh, you know, little prism to start turning and looking at how the light shines into that and it can help build a relationship. We've also helped connect people uh, to different churches and synagogues uh, or uh, in, in the city where they've said that they want to go, but they don't know how, like, they don't know where to go or what that looks like. We've helped connect people. Uh, and a lot of times, um, places of worship have someone who is ready to connect with that, right? They have somebody who's ready to meet and, uh, and work with folks who have uh, a diagnosis or maybe a little higher need, um, and we can help connect with that. Civic life is really important. That's one of the things that Zach's been working on with his, with his advocacy arm and, and uh, give him some space to talk about that in a minute. But uh, the people we serve, they, they have a right to vote. They have a right to be informed. And, and it isn't every four years. They have a right to be engaged and involved in what's happening in, in 
state capitals and what's happening at city hall um because all of those things more than more than likely affect them directly and instead of having a bunch of uh people that look and sound the same uh in suits you know behind really nice desks making decisions and signing paperwork uh that says you know this is who you are and what you are and the services you can get i think it's time for us to galvanize a group of people to really make a move uh, make a movement uh, specifically when it comes to mental health care in the United States. Uh, every time there's something that happens on the news, real quick to talk about uh, the person had a mental health crisis and, and it's their fault for, for their diagnosis where uh, I don't agree with that. I don't, pretty sure you don't either, but we don't, we don't need to get it. Yeah, we could, we could open a can of worms and get into that. We're going to ignore that. Leisure and rec. Uh, what do you do for fun? Human need to have fun. That's crazy. What? When we talk about participants and we talk about what they're doing with their lives, sometimes fun might look a little different than, than what we would encourage. Sometimes that might involve drinking a lot or, uh, you know, they don't know how to have fun without uh, crack or cocaine or something like that. So we got to help people re reassess what that even looks like and then understand that uh, there's lots of ways to connect with people and to, uh, you know, celebrate themselves and others. And, and the and what they're doing um we're lucky enough in philly that there's something happening across the city every day there's somewhere to go there's something to do there's something to see every day we provide a calendar a monthly calendar uh that has like daily events that people can go to uh and whether it be like lecture series or public movies or um different uh gallery openings or presentations at the library there's something uh, that, that someone could do every day. Um, and, you know, depending on where you're at in Delaware, you might not have, you know, there, there are some pretty rural spots where people might not have something happening every day, but um, there's something happening, you know, and there, there's different festivals and events and activities uh, that people can be encouraged to go to and just go and see, go and look and see what's happening. Family and friendship can always be difficult. Uh, and then also intimate relationships. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but we don't talk about intimate relationships that participants are in and Philip's problem. Uh, and if you're anything like, like us, it's by and large, it's when there's like a domestic uh, abuse situation. There's some kind of like something negative has been happening. That's really the only time that we talk about intimate relationships. Uh, and we got to be more proactive about this. Uh, research shows that uh, participants who receive services, people, people with psychiatric disabilities that receive services, by and large are not asked about um, any part of their life in, in their romantic inclination. Uh, that, that kind of, you know, when we don't see participants, it, it, it happens. And so we don't see these people that we work with as full humans uh, on the whole spectrum of feelings and emotions and uh, desires. Uh, that's gonna come back in other ways. Now I'm not saying like get in, like get in real deep with any of that stuff, but uh, if the only time you're going to talk to somebody about their intimate relationships is when, you know, you have to do a protection from abuse form, that's an issue, right? Like, we got to figure out a way to engage with people and at least talk to them about what their, what their wants and desires are in a very, like, um, and they're going to need help with that, obviously. Like, we're going to have to set up some boundaries and make sure they know that you asking about that doesn't mean that you're interested in that. It just means that, you know, uh, you're interested in them and who they are, and you want to, you know, help them out. Doesn't mean you're going to set up Tinder on your phone and, and help them swipe and find a partner. But all of these are just parts of conversations to, to address and, and assess the whole person. Uh, and when we don't do that, uh, we're not seeing this as a, as a, as a full human. Um, and we have less successful outcomes. So, uh, Zach, you're going to take it over for the next the next few. Yeah, um, I just noticed it is noon. Um, oh, I want to let's skip this on. one and just yeah. we'll tell you about the alumni program real quick then. Yeah, just real quick um, overview of what I've been working on. Um, speaking of uh, like believing that recovery is possible uh, and seeing folks as you know more whole humans that have complex lives and are able to do things that are beyond just sitting in their apartment that we provided from them. Uh, we've launched our alumni program, which is brand new for us. Um, we started 
the end of 2020 actually launched uh, in January of 2021. Um, we identified 10 participants who could move on from our services who were you know, sufficiently connected and feel like they're in a good place where they could move on from our uh, clinical services. They had their own housing through PHA vouchers. Um, it was voluntary, you know, we talked with them. They wanted to move on. So we found these 10 people. Um, we set a date for graduation for May. We figured we could get them moved on by then. Um, several logistical barriers pop up as they do. This work is complicated. So by September, we had eight participants graduate. Um, one wasn't able to use the voucher that she got uh, and one of them sadly passed away. Um, and right now we have 11 more on track to graduate next year. Um, we actually just had our graduation, I guess it was a month ago now, but the end of September, um, eight folks moved on and they're doing fine. And it's really great to see because it, it's almost like a shift for us, right? That like people might need these intensive supports, but in time with you know sufficient attention and connection of resources and connection to other people um, provided what they need, they might not need us forever. Some folks may, but other folks don't, which is cool to think about. Um, some of the barriers I was talking about on the next slide here, um, when folks get uh, the, sorry, can we switch to the next slide, Rob? Um, yep, yep, yep. When folks get the vouchers, um, Sometimes landlords are reluctant to accept vouchers. That's for a myriad of reasons, you know, discrimination against people that are poor, uh, bureaucratic issues with PHA, et cetera, et cetera. But it's realistically hard to use a voucher sometimes when you get it, um, which happened for one of our potential graduates. Um, they're also not always available and it's not always the same process for accessing them. So that's a barrier too for people moving on from our program. Um, and also our citywide management system, when we go into like submit the discharge to process the discharge, it's not really built for like people discharging just because they're ready to move on and don't need us anymore. It's more geared towards, oh, somebody needs to be discharged because they passed away or somebody's, you know, moved out of our area or somebody has, you know, done something else to determine that they have to be discharged from our, our programming, but it's, it kind of shows that the system isn't really built with the belief that people can move on from these services and that they might not need them forever, which I think is a, a big issue. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, that's about it. Um, so if you had questions or anything like that, uh, or if we got to wrap it up because we went over, that's, that's totally fine, but um, yeah. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, Rob. So I, I do me. I do have a quick question. Um, so for um, anybody who so for all of our service providers on the line, um, is there any low hanging fruit or immediate strategies or things that they can implement right away to start to uh, ramp up their community inclusion uh, approach if they were to sure. go start building that for their programs? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a while back, um, what kind of got me into uh, community inclusion and, and embracement, uh, I wasn't always in this role at Pathways. I was doing outreach when I originally came. And what I did is uh, I kept connecting with people after they were housed. And it, and I, some of our people that we housed who had some of the uh, biggest mental health symptoms, I just took them out to lunch and just sat across the table with them and had lunch with them uh, every once in a while even though they were housed. And that kind of like um, snowballed into where, where we are today, but it was essentially uh, breaking bread and seeing someone uh, outside of the office is huge, uh, especially when it comes to the, the participants that we work with, uh, because sometimes it's the only time they've ever ordered from a menu, right? Like if you have a, an extensive history of being unhoused, People have given you food and you get what you get and you don't complain about it. Uh, but being able to give somebody that choice to sit down and speak with a with wait staff and to order from a menu, that's like the lowest barrier sort of uh, interaction that you can have and sort of model what that looks like. Uh, what we've done since then is, you know, 
get a couple people together, get two or three people together, start working on those peer relationships. Uh, you get a group of people who uh, you take out to a museum, they get to know each other, uh, and then they start building those relationships. And instead of calling you about everything that they need, they start calling their peer, they start calling somebody else who receives services, they kind of share that information back and forth. Uh, and we've been able to have some great outcomes with stuff like that. Uh, we had a group of ladies that uh, started with two of them, uh, turned in about uh, four or five of them, I think. But one day four of them were out. There was one who had been in a, in a really rough relationship. Uh, and the two ladies who had kind of started the thing started saying like, you deserve more than this. You don't need to, you don't need him. You need to get him out of your apartment. He's not even, on, he's, where would he be? You're, where would he be without you getting this apartment? Get him out of there. Make him do his own thing. And just like it kind of switched some stuff in her head and she wound up uh, ending that really unhealthy relationship and has been in a, in a way better place since. But some of that is just like hearing from your friends that you don't need this. That you like, uh, and that um, they said some other stuff about how the team could support that and, and stuff like that. But that didn't come from staff. That came from uh, other participants who have been through very similar situations. Um, and I think, as, as we all know, a, a lot of uh, women who have experienced being on house have, have a lot of trauma around a lot of that stuff and, and have been through um, some really uh, horrible situations. Uh, and for me or, or somebody who looks like me to talk to them about some of that is very different than somebody who has lived it themselves saying, no, you don't need this anymore. Get rid of this guy. He's, he's, he's dead weight. Um, and that was really good too. So those are some really simple, easy ones. Start with, you know, it's as easy as taking someone out for lunch, not doing paperwork, not doing, you know, just, Hey, where are you from? how do you want, like, tell me about you and, uh, start building and modeling those relationships. And then eventually, um, you can start grafting in some other folks and they can start doing that too. Because really what we're doing is modeling how to have a positive interaction, uh, which is a lot of times our folks haven't had in a long time. Thank you, Rob and Zach. This was a really, um, I think, impactful and important presentation about a really important role that, that, these, that a lot of folks here play in the community. Um, uh, for the people that they serve. Um, if you have another five minutes, I'd like to allow some folks to ask some questions. Sure. Um, so if folks have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and ask. Or comments. I have, hi, it's Mimi, I have one. Uh, wondering what area do you serve? What area do you two serve? And, and how close to where we are, are you all working? Uh, we're, we're both in Philadelphia. And so we Hi. serve the whole county. So we're 45 minutes from Wellington. Yeah. I don't know where you, do you are. Have partners? Do you have partners that work in Chester and take it all the way down to the border? Um, no, we're just in Philadelphia County right now. Got it. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. you do. I loved your presentation. You, you really do both seem to work from the heart and I appreciated that. Well, I appreciate your kind words in the, in the chat. You were uh, encouraging us while we were going. That, that was really appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Also, I'll make a comment, which is that I love your headshots. I recently tried to take one of my, it's very hard to get a good headshot. So nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. We, uh, I was doing family, family portraits uh, a couple years ago, and I said, wait, 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 I, it's hard to do headshots. Can I just grab one real quick? And uh, we did that. And then Zach left out a little bit after that. We have uh, our development department. Yeah, we have a great, um, a great development team. Nice. Talented photographer. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions or comments before we say goodbye? Well, thank you all so much for um, attending and your participation today. We hope you found today's meeting useful. I definitely did. Um, and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.